for us in our church, we're going to do something called a series called Christmas Colors. This is probably one of the most colorful seasons of the year. You trim your tree with colorful decorations. You hang your lights that are colorful. You bake Christmas cookies that are colorful. You wrap presents that are colorful. Everything we do seems to be colorful. So I'd like to talk about those three primary colors over the next three weeks. Give each of them kind of a, an identity as we talk about what Christmas means. And we're going to start with this first one, the white. You wonder why I'm wearing a white shirt? Anybody figure that out? We're going to talk about Christmas as being white. And I'm going to dream of a white Christmas. Well, what does that white Christmas look like to you? Uh, n- nostalgic people here remember back when children would listen and treetops would glisten with Perry Como and, and others of you might think back to other times. Most of us like snow uh, just a little bit at Christmas. I haven't met anybody that says, I want a green Christmas. We like to have some snow. Not the snow that Duluth got, though. Not, not like that. Anybody from Duluth here today? They're still digging out. Isn't it amazing? Now, this picture, I think, is from Canada somewhere, but, but I do believe that some of us dream of white Christmases, but not quite like this. When I think about dreaming about a white Christmas, I'm thinking about forgiveness. When I think about the beautiful white that God can bring in our life, it's because of Christmas. He wants to take our stained hearts and make them clean. Clean as driven snow. And that's the message today. And I want you to think about Christmas as God's message to you. Whatever you've done, wherever you've been, whoever you've been, I want to forgive you today. It's interesting, the whole story of Christmas, the narrative at the center of it is forgiveness. If you remember Joseph, when he was told that his his soon-to-be wife was pregnant already, and he tried to work through that whole discussion of how this could happen and what it would do to his life, the angel just said to him, you know, Mary's going to give birth to a son, and you're going to give him the name Jesus, Jesus. For thousands of years, they'd look forward to this day when God would send his son who would save us from our sins. You know, the message of Christmas, Jesus came, for God so loved the world that he sent his son that we might be forgiven for our sin. He came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. And throughout the New Testament, it points to Jesus as as forgiveness. Jesus came to forgive us. Now, to tell that story, I'm going to turn to an Old Testament book, a prophetic book by the man named Isaiah. He wrote about 800 years before the time of Christ, and he was looking forward to the coming of Jesus. It's from Isaiah. We get the wonderful counselor, mighty God. We get the wonderful name, Emmanuel. The the, the government will be on his shoulders. It's just a marvelous, marvelous prophetic book, looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. It begins, though, with quite a different story. It talks about the condition of the people. Kind of of four little chapters we're going to look at really quickly about the sin of the people, and, and then their suffering. And then there are attempts at solutions and, and then forgiveness that God offers. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, and I'm going to be reading. And this is a collection from the New Living Translation and from the message. And I'll tell you when I read from the message, which is kind of a loose paraphrase. But as I read this, I want you to see that this could have been written about us. The vision that Isaiah had was for Jerusalem and Judah, but it's also for us. The, the story, I think the progression in this story fits in many ways your life. It just seems spiritually, when we look at the, 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 the history of our life, this, what, what follows? First of all, our sin. Hear, O heavens, listen, O earth. This is what the Lord says. The children I raised and cared for have turned against me. Even the animals, the donkey and the ox, know their owner and appreciate his care. But not my people Israel. No matter what I do for them, they still do not understand. Do you hear that disappointment in the Father? No matter what I do... They don't understand. Oh, what a sinful nation they are. They are loaded down with a burden of guilt. They are evil and corrupt children who've turned away from the Lord. They've despised the Holy One of Israel, cutting themselves off from his help. We have sinned, and then we suffer. Why do you continue to invite punishment? Must you rebel forever? Your head is injured and your heart is sick. You are sick from head to foot, covered with bruises and welts and infected wounds without any ointment or bandages. Your country lies in ruins and your cities are burned. 
As you watch foreigners plunder your fields and destroy everything they see. God says, in your sin, why, why do you continue to suffer so? If you would just make some changes, if you just turn back to me, we could end this suffering. But in their stubbornness, they come up with their own solutions. And this is from the message. I just love the language. Why this frenzy of sacrifices? Don't you think I've had my fill of burnt sacrifices and rams? When you come before me, whoever gave you the idea of acting like this, running here and there, doing this and that, all this sheer commotion in the place provided for worship. I am sick of your religion. 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 While you go right on sinning with bloody hands. You see, the solution wasn't to change their life. It was just to continue on the path they had chosen. There was no repentance. There was no transformation. It was just an acceptance of this lifestyle of wandering away from God. And in that, their lives were filled with blood. I think this describes so many of us. Now, this is the part that many of us would recognize. You know, I don't know if you recognize a lot of what's in Isaiah other than from the song, The Messiah. But this section, you'll know. And I want us to read this out loud. Could you read this with me? Come now. Let us settle the matter. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be. I think God is saying to us today, come, come now. There's a better way. The way you've chosen, the path you're following is not a good way. Come now, let's reason together. Now, he's not saying let's debate this out. No, he said, come, I'm going to show you a better way. So listen, let's pray together. Father God, I believe there are a couple people here today that are seeking forgiveness, and they don't know where to turn. And I pray that they might experience a white Christmas this year. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Maybe may be seated. I, I just need to tell you, there's a rumor out I wore a tie last night. I, I thought better of it this morning. But I really believe that Christmas is a time that changes everything, and it can change even your life. God wants to tell you that there can be another way of living your life. You don't need to continue on the path you're on. It's interesting. When I look at this, I, I want to talk about snow. You know, not often in the scriptures, if you've ever been to Israel, you don't think it snows there. It does snow there. They understood snow. And I want to take three qualities of snow and kind of apply that to our lives and trying to understand a little bit of what forgiveness is and what it isn't. Snow, of course, covers things. Snow is pure. Driven snow is the purest of all snow. And snow drifts. So if you're trying to keep track of notes or if you're wondering if we're going to finish before the Viking game, you can kind of, that, that's the outline right there, okay? You can follow along. Before I get to snow covers, I want to talk about this. Though your sins are like scarlet. I, I grew up hearing this from my family. Your heart is covered, stained by your sin. Now, as a young boy, I didn't understand what that really meant. I, I had my, my school clothes and I had my play clothes and, and, and they were all stained. And very clearly, my mom was trying to teach me this principle that when I sin, it stains my life. And it comes right back to scripture. Your sins are like scarlet. That word scarlet, it's the Hebrew word for this red dye, double dyed. And it's not something that you could wash out. When you dyed something with this scarlet color, it would stay. It would stain. There, there's something I know about you. I, I can't see a lot of you. I don't know some of your names. But I know you, like me, have sinned. Yeah, that, that, that's a Bible principle. Now, I know some churches don't talk about this, and it's the hidden secret. But guys, you're not perfect. I could just talk to your mother and prove it to you. You know you've sinned. Or talk to your kids, even better yet. Be because all of us have fallen short, of course, of God's glory, of his expectations for our life. But I want to say this. You've even fallen short of your own expectations. Uh, I haven't been with anybody that tell tells me, Dan, I'm 100%. What you see here is a perfect man. No, no, none of you can say that. And, and sin to me is, you know, we could describe all the different kinds of sin, but sin is just brokenness with God. It's a broken relationship. The creator God who loves us, and he cries out. You, you heard those first few verses. Cries out to us to come back to him, and we keep moving in the opposite direction. That's sin. 
the very one who gives us all things. We're, we're ungrateful. We don't listen. And we choose our own path. And it says in the scriptures, it's a path that leads to destruction and suffering. That, that's what we read. All of us have sinned. And in that brokenness with God, it's also found in brokenness with other people. And a lot of you could share how there's a brokenness in your family, with your spouse, bro brokenness with your children, brokenness with your brothers and sisters. Some of you, Christmas is a difficult time because you see all the brokenness that have come to be your life. Though your sins are like scarlet, Sometimes when you look in the mirror, you see the stains in your life. You're well aware of that, the fact that you are a sinner. Now, now sometimes we look at other people and you say, at least I'm not as bad as him. I'm glad I'm not Dan, my goodness. Well, I'm better than others. And, and it's amazing how we deal with sin in so many different ways. And we look at our stain and we try and kind of camouflage it with all kinds of rationalizations. But deep at the core, we know there is a stain. We've been talking about listening to God over the last few weeks, and, uh, and God has a sense of humor. When I sleep, usually, I just go to sleep. Man, I just, and then I wake up in the morning, and then I do it again, just for a couple more minutes, of course. And, and I just sleep really well, and I don't dream very often, but when I dream and I wake up and I remember them, I usually think it's a message from God. And as I was preparing for this message, it was Friday night, I went to deep sleep, and, and I woke up sweating in a frenzy. And I had this vivid dream, and I remembered exactly what was going on. And I was driving a car, and I had my son in the car, and I was driving way too fast, and I was reckless, and I'd broken all kinds of laws. And, and I don't know the urgency, but I was very clear. I'd broken so many laws, and the police had pulled me over, and I was looking at a lifetime in prison. And I woke up, and I said, oh, praise be to God, I'm here. <laughs> but God just let me for a moment feel the weight of sin. And I was so desperate. I realized I had done something so terrible. I had endangered so many lives. And, and I was going away for life. And when I woke up, it was so good to realize that I was free, that that wasn't true. I, I'm praying that some of you today might experience that. That you dream at night and you're well aware that you have sinned. And, and it's a reality that you wake up to and it hasn't gone away. And you're saying, if there'd be some way that I could deal with this pain, this weight, this stain, this sin in my life, and I tell you, there is. It's interesting. Though your sins are like scarlet. Uh, what's interesting about snow is snow covers. Have you ever noticed that? Like, like this last week, I don't know about you, the snow, the snow was beautiful. It came down, it covered all the leaves I hadn't bothered to rake yet. They're there, but they're hidden. Isn't this beautiful? They cover the trees and, 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 you know, the garbage that's around and the litter. And, you know, as much as Minnesota and Plymouth is a beautiful place, Maple Grove, wherever you live, why is that? A, you know, the, 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 there's messes around and there's cul-de-sac areas that aren't clean. And, there's a, and it covers it all and it looks so beautiful, doesn't it? Even if you don't like snow, you have to admit it. It's so beautiful, this covering that covers everything. But here's the problem. It melts. You know, that, that, that which is covered is still there. This, this dog, there's a the rest of his body there. You might see it, but it's there. And, and so is your sin. And here, here's my warning to you. Don't just cover up your sin. Too many of us think that if I just can cover it up, people can't see my stain, then it's okay. And so we're busy covering our tracks, and we're deleting our emails, and we're clearing our, our browser data, and we're breaking some relationships with people that know the story, and we're rationalizing, justifying. And I find a lot of you try and manage your stain, the sin in your life, by just covering it. If I dress up enough, people will never know. Now, it doesn't work in the spring. When the snow melts, that dirt becomes mud, the garbage begins to stink, and the leaves are rotten. It's amazing. You can cover things for a time, but then the covering's removed. Now, some of you are saying, wait a second, the scripture says that there's a covering, that sin is covered. Now, I just want to stop and say, I know the Bible, 
And the word atonement means to cover. And, and the Old Testament speaks of our sin being covered. But in every context, that covering is, is looking forward to the coming of Jesus who takes away our sin. And even in this passage that quotes several passages from the Old Testament, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. It's not just to cover it up, it's to remove it. The sin stain can't stay. And I'm so afraid that some of you are just really good at covering things. Don't run away, but I think some of you are here because this is a part of the covering. If I go to, go to church, well, it looks like I got everything dealt with. You know, you can put on as many white shirts as you want, and the stain is still there. <laughs> my dad, I love my dad. My dad is gone. He's in heaven. Harry. He was called Big Harry because he was a huge guy. He had these hands that were so big that if he ever spanked you with him, I always said he'd spank me right into eternity. Like, he had huge hands. And that was my dad, Big Harry. The one thing he wasn't very good at was home repair. <laughs> my dad fixed everything with baler wire and duct tape and calendars. So let me explain. So in our house, whenever there would be a hole in the wall, my dad would hang a calendar over it. <laughs> it worked really well. He taught me. We, we were fixing this camper one time, putting in a stereo system for him, and, and I made a hole in the wall, and we, it was in the wrong spot. I said, oh, Dad, I'm so sorry. He said, that's all right. We'll get a calendar, and he put it right there. <laughs> My mom knew under every calendar in our house there was a hole. Now, that, that, that's just fine until the calendars come down. Now, of course, I learned this from my dad. I went to Bethel. I was an RA at Bethel, and, and Bethel boys would tend to do this. We were roughhousing one time. We were wrestling and punched a hole in our wall, just right between the, the, the joists, right? Just a big hole there, and I took my, this tells you the age, my Cheryl Tiggs poster, <laughs> moved it over the hole, right? And, and we just kept that there, and my roommates, we all knew the hole was there, but we soon forgot, Cheryl Tiggs is on the wall. There's no problem. And, and they all left. And I was the last guy in the RA. It took down all the posters and everything. And there's the hole. And I had to pay the fine. Because it was covered. It wasn't gone. So I, I just want to warn you. If there are stains in your life, sin in your life, and you think it's all covered, that your parents don't know, or that your spouse doesn't know, or that your pastor doesn't know, or the police don't know, or whoever, they don't know, it will be known. It says in Timothy, it says, some things are made aware right away. Our sins are uncovered right away, and others follow us to be exposed at another time. All you have to do is read the news. Celebrities holding hands of another girl, thinking they're getting away. Ah! Everybody sees. Politicians with histories removed from office. Pastors here in our own city. Things from the past follow them. So I just want to ask, Sin in your life? Of course there is. Stains in your life? Of course there is, like me. But are you dealing with it? Or are you just covering it up? Snow covers up your sin, but that's not the remedy here. There's another one. Snow is pure. And I think that's the image in Isaiah. Don't just cover your sin. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. It doesn't say they shall be covered by snow. It doesn't say that. It says, no, your body, your life, your heart shall be as white as snow. That that which is stained will come clean. That which is impure will be made pure. That which is soiled will be unspoiled. And if you find yourself struggling with any kind of sin in your life, God says, come to me and I will take that which is impure and I will make it pure. I'm not a big Shakespeare fan, but my wife likes Shakespeare, so then I like Shakespeare. And I've gone to a few things just so she'll let me go to a few basketball games and stuff like that. And and I did watch Macbeth one time, and the, the only thing I really remember from the whole thing is, is Lady Macbeth and her obsession. Do you remember that? So she collaborated with somebody to take the life of, I think, a Scotman, and in that she felt the blood on her hands. And she kept having these dreams, waking up in the middle of the night and, and, and sleepwalking, washing her hands, wringing her hands. Out, damn spot. Out. She saw her hands covered in blood, and whatever she did to try and wipe her hands clean was never enough. Out, damn spot, out. And I wonder how many of you have been wringing your hands, 
trying to cover your sin or find ways of washing them clean. Like, like in Isaiah, they sacrificed, they gave, they gave, they gave, they, they gathered together in assemblies and they became very religious and, and they offered prayers, not from their heart, but prayers for performance. And, and what they did is they continued in their sin and they did all these things thinking that would wash away their sin, but it did not. Very simply, the scriptures tell us, no, snow is pure. And if you come, I think, to Jesus today, this Christmas, he can take those stains and wash them away. Forgiveness removes them, just, just, just doesn't cover them. The story in the Old Testament is just so good about David and Bathsheba, if you remember, where David um, struggles in his sin, and he goes and he commits adultery with this woman, and and he recognizes it's wrong, so he tries to cover it up. And he brings in her husband, Uriah. And then he betrays every confidence by having Uriah killed. And, and he has the blood on his hands. And we find that David, when he speaks about this stain of sin, he understands it. His life is stained. He has blood on his hands. And if you remember, Nathan comes and confronts him and points to him and says, You're the man, David. Look, look, at, look at your hands. Look at your heart. And it tells us that David struggles. He can't sleep at night. His bones feel like they're breaking. His body is under this heavy burden. And he cries out to God, the living God, save me, save me, save me. And I just love, in, in Psalm chapter 51, he speaks, I think, of the solution to all of us. Though our sins be as scarlet, wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. There's only one place we can go to deal with the sin in our life. It's to God himself who sent his son Jesus to die on a cross that we might be washed clean. The book of Revelation is so good. It talks about those who endure the tribulation. Whether we're in that or not, I don't know. I know that some of you are tribulating right now. There's trouble in your life. And I just love what it says in Revelation. It says, they washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. There's this choir of elders walking with these white, white robes, speaking of the goodness of the blood of the Lamb that will wash them clean. Today, do you feel the stain of sin? There's one place to be washed clean. It's Jesus. Boy, I, uh, first youth pastor position I had was in Chicago. While I was at Bethel, I went for the summer as a part of their summer missions program. And the inner city of Chicago, down on the south side, if you know Chicago, Rainbow Park, uh, I was one of the few white guys in a very, very dark community, very, very diverse community. And, and it was a challenge for me to live there. I have to be honest, I grew up on the farm, and, and it, to be cross-cultural was Norwegian and Swedish. That's, that's how I grew up. And being downtown, I was called honky wherever I went. And, and I just remember it was just transformation time of me experiencing the world, a different world that I experienced. I was given the, the, the junior high class. I had about 13 teenagers to deal with, all of them African-American from the inner city. And, and I remember that city. I just go, I've driven by there even now just to see it again. And I, I remember parents bringing their, their toddlers by and dropping them off at the school. They had to go to work, and they had no daycare, so they drop them off in the this, this church parking lot, which had a fence around it, and they said, don't leave the parking lot. And they'd leave those little kids there all day long. And what, what kind of life is this? And then my, my teenagers in my class, I, I tried to teach them. You know, I had been teaching vacation Bible school at, at our country church. This was a different place. The stories I used to tell didn't, didn't really resonate with them. And it was just really a struggle. And I, I remember just talking to the kids there and, and just trying to share the stories of the gospel. And it was just so hard. There's a young girl that was hired by the city of Chicago to ca actually work in our class. And she was an agnostic. She, she didn't want God in her life at all. And she sat at the back of my class. And when I would try and teach the kids to a truth, she would try and unteach it. She was at the back of the class, just constantly, constantly harassing the kids. And I'm thinking, God, I don't know what to do. I still remember, I have a journal I wrote in there. I don't know what to do here. I don't know what to say here. And then at the end of the, the, the time with these kids, and I got to know these kids and their families, and I learned to love them. And, and I remember one of the kids, his name was Raymond. And he was a tough kid. I, I think he was like 13. He had been shot at, chased, beaten with a bat. He was almost living alone. His family was in and out. He was at his grandma's most of the time, but on the streets. Ray Raymond had experienced more of life at, at 13 than I did at 21. 
And I remember sitting with Raymond in the class, and I was thinking, how is he going to take this message? And the girl in the back, she kind of had her sweets for him, you know? He was, he was kind of a man in a boy's body, and, and she had the sweets for him. And I said, how is this going to work out? And in the last day of class, I think it was the last day or one of the last days, I just uh, brought the gospel message to these kids. And I told them the story of the prodigal son, and, and I told them how the boy came back to his father, and, and I talked about a loving heavenly father that cares for them, and a lot of them had never had a father, and we talked about that, and... And then I just told them, if you guys want to respond to Jesus, here's a great opportunity to do that. And I, I said, some of you will go outside and just to play and do as we've done every day. But if you want to stop and, and begin a relationship with Jesus, just stay in the classroom. And so all the kids got up, but Raymond and that girl. She stood at the back of the class, not to accept Jesus, but just to taunt him. And he stood there before me, and he's crying. <laughs> he, he wanted to come back. He wanted to find his father. And he said something to me that I'll never forget, the, the honest truth. He said, Dan, I got up this morning and I, I put on my jeans, my favorite jeans, these jeans. And, and he said, you see the stain here? Terrible stain. And I put them in the wash again and I washed them again and, and the stain didn't come out. And it, it can't come out. And as you were talking just a few minutes before, I realized that my heart is stained just like that. And no matter what I do and how many times I've tried to wash it, the things I've done don't go away. I want them to go away. Can Jesus take them away? And we looked at Zechariah chapter 3. I just love this text where the high priest stands before God about to make an offering to God and, and Satan comes and, and points his finger at him and makes him guilty. He says, who do you think you are to stand before God? Who do you think? Look at your body, your clothes. They're dirty, they're filthy, you're stained. And as, as the high priest is about to make an offering, Satan comes and, and, and is all of a sudden worried about his holiness. And then God's booming voice comes forth and said, this is the one that I love, that I've snatched from the fire. Take off his dirty clothes and put on white raiment. And I told that to Raymond. And I said, God will take off these dirty clothes and he'll give you a new heart and a new soul and a new beginning. And he did. I can't wait. One of the things in heaven is I'm going to look for Raymond and I'm going to talk about these white clothes we got on because of Christmas. Are you ready for that? Like Raymond? There's nothing you can do to wash it clean. Nothing. But, but it doesn't end there. I just love this. It goes on and says, though they are red as crimson, they should be like wool. Now, I used to think that was just another way of saying it. It's a preacher who repeats himself. A chiasm in the Hebrew. A parallelism. No, no, no. This is something new and different. Follow with me. The first part, scarlet, is about color. It's red in color, a double dye. The crimson is about contamination. It's a word that's used for the manna that they would keep beyond the day they should. The, the worms would get in and they would rotten the manna. And so this is talking about contamination. Though your life be filled with contaminated things, though the original creation that God gave to you has now been somehow tainted by sin, changed by sin, it can be restored to better than usual. That's what it says. Though your life has been filled with crimson, you've experienced the worm and the contamination, the staleness and the stain, God will make it brand new like wool. It started good. That's transformation. The old is gone. The new comes. God takes our past and gives us a future. He takes that which is broken and he makes it brand new. God doesn't waste a hurt. He doesn't take the past and rub our nose in it. He says, I have new plans for you. But you must come to me and ask for my forgiveness. He takes that which is scarlet, makes it white as snow. And he takes that which is contaminated and makes it brand new. Forgiveness restores the person. I end with this. Snow also drifts. You know, I don't know about you, but the, the danger in driving is when it starts drifting. I've often told my wife, just wait. Don't, don't shovel out the, the, the driveway. Just wait. It'll all go over to the neighbors in a moment. But then the other neighbors comes to my house. Snow drifts. It passes around. There's something about snow, and I think the Christmas message that if you receive this forgiveness I'm talking about, you can't keep it. You have to give it away. That's what it's all about. 
And I just love this picture. I saw it online. It was probably one of you, but I just thought it was so cute. You've got you to let this sink in, okay? This is just profound. If you want me to send you this picture, I will. Don't be the person on the left. That's the religious person who receives forgiveness and doesn't give it away. It's the person who does his own work but doesn't share it with anybody else. Don't be the person on the left. Some of you are today. You've received freely God's forgiveness, his great grace. He has washed away your sin. He's created in you a new heart. But you're harboring resentment against all kinds of people. You're just like that person. As God has forgiven you, you must forgive other people. And as you have forgiven other people, God will forgive you. That, that's, that, that's throughout the scripture. And I just would suggest that you need, I think, this year to give the gift of forgiveness to your dad. Some of you haven't forgiven your dad. He did things, he forgot things, he said things. And he did some terrible things, but you need to forgive him today. Your mom, your mom said things that still bite to the core. And some of you at Christmas, just to go to her house is overwhelming. It's time to forgive your mom. Some of it's your children. You expect your children to grow up on the path that you've laid before them, and they've chose other paths, and it's causing all sorts of pain. It's time to forgive your kids. Love your kids. Uh, it might be a stranger, somebody that offended you, some, somebody that did something in your life and, and you can't let it go. It's time to give the gift of forgiveness away. Now, I just want to say it's a gift that you give to yourself, really. Forgiveness, I think, as so many people say it's for other people. It's really for you. Just think about this. Not forgiving someone is like drinking poison, expecting the other person to die. How does that work? I'm going to do this to you. And the person you're wounding is yourself. Or this one here. To forgive is to set a prisoner free, only to discover that the prisoner was you. Forgiveness, the, the Greek word, is basically to lift up. To lift up our sin, the weight of sin. It's a little bit like the Frozen movie. To let it go! <laughs> Just let it go. It's to let it go. It's some, somebody has done something. Do you, can you let, let it go? Can you stop trying to collect from them? Now, now some of you say, Dan, that's, that's virtually impossible. Let, let, let me give you three things that I've learned, because I have somebody I've got to forgive. I, I'm going to give this gift of forgiveness. Now, I'm not going to call this person up and say, I forgive you. He's going to look at me like, ah! I'm going to choose to forgive him. It's a choice. I choose to forgive this person. And in doing that, I need to do it at least 490 times. You see, when Peter said, how often do I need to forgive my friend, my, my brother? 70 times 7, I think he was on to something. You don't feel forgiveness. So I don't feel like I forgive. Of course you don't. You've got to choose to do it again and again and again and again. Every day I choose to, to forgive that person because they've done something terrible. You don't excuse them. You don't justify what they've done. You don't, don't rationalize it. No, what they've done is a tragedy. So I choose to forgive them today and tomorrow and the next day and eventually. And this is where you've got to trust me. You begin to feel like you can forgive them. It takes all kinds of time. Now, when I choose to forgive somebody, I have to choose to not let them occupy my mind, my space, my family, my relationships. For some of you, somebody's done something in your life, and that person is always right here. You've allowed them to take residence in your life. Now, kick them out. They, they aren't renting space in your life. Get rid of them. You can't let them dwell in the midst of your life, your person. Don't let them occupy that space. Some of the worst perpetrators of some of the most heinous things in life love to be in your mind. Don't let them, let, don't let them occupy that space. And, and secondly, don't let bitterness fuel you. I have found when people have been treated, mistreated, one of the things that goes away is passion and emotion and the ability to embrace life. And, and the only thing that can drive them is bitterness and anger. Don't become that person. You know, depression is just anger at yourself. One of the persons you have to forgive is yourself. Now, I know that's oversimplification. And I, I, I just I appreciate that some of you struggle with depression, but can you forgive yourself? That anger that you have? Don't let it fuel you because you run out of gas really quick. 
And then last of all, it's a choice not to let vengeance rule you. I just want to pay them back. I want them to feel what I feel. They need to come and say they're sorry. They need to make it right. I want them to suffer. And I, I need to tell you, God is a just God. And the people that sow things in your life, they will reap things. God will do that. Justice is his. Vengeance is mine, says God. And I choose to do this. When I forgive somebody, give them the gift. I don't let them occupy my mind, my life. I'm going to do my best, my best to try and just let myself be filled with the love of Christ, the gentleness of Christ, the hope of Christ. And then I give it away and say, God, it's in your hands. It's in your hands. Can you give the gift of forgiveness? Here's two takeaways. Maybe this week you could just take your children and and cut out snowflakes. Just just make snowflakes. They don't know how to do it. You can look it on YouTube if you forgot how. Make snowflakes. And then talk about forgiveness. And talk about how sometimes when we do things that are wrong, we get stained. and, And God wants to give us a clean heart, a new heart. And you can present that to your children. They'll see the snowflake, and they'll remember that Christmas is a white Christmas because forgiveness comes through Jesus. And then others of you might need to make a gift, to wrap a gift, and put it under your tree with the name of a person that you need to forgive. And, and don't take that gift to them. Just keep it as a reminder that I've given them a gift. I've forgiven them. In a moment, we're going to pray. And, and if you'd like to pray for something in your life, come on down to the front. We'll pray with you. Maybe it's about forgiveness. Maybe it's about somebody you need to forgive. Maybe it's about something completely different. But I'd love to have you pray with us. Let's pray. God, you are a good God, and you sent your son Jesus to save us from our sin. And God, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas for many here that they might for the first time realize that, yes, the stains of their life can be washed clean through the blood of Jesus, that they can find a reset in their life, begin over again with a new life. God, you take the old, and you bring the new. Oh God, might we not walk out of this place trying to cover up our sin any longer, but rather might we expose it to you freely and openly and be healed today through Jesus. Might this be the whitest Christmas possible for many here today. And God, I pray that you give us the courage to give the gift of forgiveness to people that have truly hurt us, to let them go. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.